12. The Night Beat starts right now. Here you go, here you go. The moment a group of complete strangers came together to save a life in San Antonio, the effort to rescue the victim from a rollover. We hear from the man behind the camera coming up. But first, the fate of a police chief hangs in the balance tonight. The rules are set, but there are still several more steps before we learn the fate of Uvalde School District Police Chief. Pete Arredondo's termination hearing was on the agenda for tonight's school board meeting. Our members didn't make a decision on whether Arredondo is staying or going, but they did decide how the legal process is going to move forward. The night team's Lee Waldman joins us now live out of Uvalde. Lee, much of their discussions were behind closed doors, so what were you able to figure out? Well, the board members met with an attorney to talk about the procedural rules and legal representation when it comes to Pete Arredondo's termination hearing, but they did stop short of naming a hearing date. That closed door se session you mentioned lasted for over an hour, but when they reconvened, board members voted unanimously to approve Walsh Gallegos as their legal representation. At this point, we know that the board is planning on meeting with families privately to tell them the date of Arredondo's termination hearing before making a public Public announcement tonight. There was a 15 minute public forum at the start of the meeting. For the first time, we heard someone defending the actions of police. Gilbert Limon said he was one of the first people shot at by the shooter outside of Hillcrest Memorial Funeral Home. Limon says the police acted in extreme caution and the only person responsible for the robbed tragedy was the shooter. His words were met with outrage from others in attendance at this meeting. I'm not here to disrespect the families that have lost a loved one. Trust me, I work at the funeral home. I was there helping them. Three minutes is up, sir. We just want to say, I am As Limones was leaving, he was confronted by a parent and told he was pathetic. A Valdi police officer escorted him out. Now tonight, we also learned that there is going to be a grievance hearing for Superintendent Dr. Hal Harold. The date for that next Monday, August 22nd at 6 p.m. Also next week, meet the teacher meetings are beginning for this school year. Live in Uvalde, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Lee, thank you. And students at Uvalde School District aren't going to begin classes until next month. But some of the students who were at Rob Elementary are actually starting their classes earlier. And that's because many of them transferred over to the Sacred Heart Catholic School where classes began this morning. Now, Sacred Heart says that it began the year with more than 100 students in Uvalde. That's more than double its enrollment since last fall. Some of, the, of those families got help with tuition. The Catholic school says that it's installed ballistic grade enhancements to its doors and windows, eight foot fencing and a security verification system for its main entrance. In the wake of what happened at Rob Elementary, security measures across school districts continue to be a major concern. And tonight, the head of the Texas Education Agency answered our questions about parents' worries. TEA Commissioner Mike Morath was in town today and spoke with the night team's John Paul Barajas. In the nearly three months since the Uvalde shooting, Texas education officials say they've made school safety a top priority. We, public education, have literally checked every single exterior door of every single facility in the state of Texas, make sure that they close and they lock and they perform properly. Schools all over the state of Texas are reevaluating their access control procedures. and make sure Commissioner Mike Morath of the Texas Education Agency explains districts are taking several steps to protect students. That includes limited access for visitors, additional safety and security training for staff, and the creation of threat assessment teams on every campus. So this is a small group that are listening to all the sort of inbound um, uh, reports. And sometimes it's uh, somebody saying, I saw something on social media. Sometimes it's something um, somebody does after school, something somebody does in school. And so these team are, is trained to just look at those factors, evaluate them, and then come up with the appropriate case management strategy. While some of these protocols were already in place at some schools, the commissioner tells us there has been a lack of consistent execution across the state. So what we have done this summer is ensure consistent approach to training, to uh, security protocol analysis, to exterior access control and review to make sure that um, uh, that every school is as safe as we can possibly make it. 
Now, last week we told you about State Senator Jose Menendez's push to make Election Day a school holiday. Commissioner Morath says that might be logistically tough to do because of how long early voting runs. He also says the TEA is well on the way to hiring a new chief of school security and safety, which is a position ordered to be created and filled by Governor Abbott. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Now, the Texas Education Agency released a list of ratings for school districts and campuses. It's the first time that we've seen that list since the pandemic disrupted learning. Now, Somerset ISD received a, an, a grade of an o, of A overall, and Commissioner Mike Morath celebrated the district for its improvements. Now, Southside ISD also saw huge improvements. One of its schools, Heritage Elementary, previously got an F, but now it got an A. It's only one of two schools in the state to do that. And you can check what grade your district received right now on KSAT.com. Well, the day started off with some rain around San Antonio, all because of this low pressure system, this tropical low, which is now pushing well west of our viewing area. I do have to say, though, that Eagle Pass is getting some good rain right now. And unfortunately for Laredo, it's too much of a good thing. Flash flooding being reported earlier this evening and ongoing in Laredo. They've seen three to five inches of rain and water rescues have even taken place in Laredo this evening. Now, tomorrow, uh, dropping off the kids, 76 degrees. It's going to be humid and warm, but when you pick them up, up 96 though the heat index of up to 102. If you missed out on the rain uh, today, we do have some opportunities in the days ahead that forecast for you coming up. See you in a few minutes. Thank you, Sarah. Well, we're less than three months away from the November elections and as the clock counts down, threats are ramping up against poll workers. The elections administrator and her staff in Gillespie County resigned following threats and stalking there. That's according to the Fredericksburg newspaper and in Bear County Elections Administrator Jackie Callanan tells us her staff dealing with threats made in the name of so-called election integrity. She says her office is seeing a rise in unusual open records requests and demands for information they can't provide. For instance, they're demanding the source code of all of the election equipment we have. Well, th that can't happen and it is very tiring very demoralizing. For his part, Republican Party Chair Jeff McManus told Callanan he was sorry about whoever's behind the bullying and harassment. Callanan has been running elections in Bear County. She has bipartisan support on the elections board. And this all follows the defeat of former President Donald Trump in the last election. Now the former president facing an FBI investigation over classified documents found inside his Florida home. Some of the information may have been related to nuclear weapons terrorism, even spies. Now law enforcement officials trying to track down who saw or handled the materials in Trump's home. And as that's playing out, the FBI facing an unprecedented number of threats itself following the search of the president's Mar-a-Lago home. Back here at home, there is one stretch of road that people say is notorious for crashes. We're talking about Culebra Road. One section just outside of Loop 410 had seen more than 100 wrecks in just the last year. The group Vision Zero launched a three-month pilot campaign for Culebra, and among the top concerns they heard were speeding, congested traffic, and people not using crosswalks. Now, Don Page has lived in that area for 22 years, and he's telling us he is ready for things to get better. I've been a part of some discussion groups and surveys over the last two years. Uh, that's promising, but we're really ready to see some things start to happen out here to really improve the situation. So transportation officials are saying that they're reminding people about the 44 crosswalks along the 13 miles of Culebra Road. They map them all out and they're sending them out to people in the area. In the meantime, we expect to learn more about the potential solutions for Culebra Road once a study is done, and that should happen by the end of the year. This is all part of our Solutionary series, and you can find more episodes by scanning that QR code that you see on your screen right now. Solutionaries is a conversation-style digital show that tackles issues facing our community and also focuses on solutions-based journalism. And by the way, this month's episode is going to center around safer streets. Now for a look at your headlines in your night beat news flash. Check that fridge. Kraft Heinz recalling cases of their kids drink Capri Sun, specifically the wild cherry flavor, since it may have been diluted with some cleaning solution in it that was actually used at the facility. 
Look for the Best Buy date of June 25th of next year, then take it back. And four moms recalling some of their baby swings and rockers because an infant can get tangled in the straps. For these recalls and others, you can check out our website, ksat.com. San Antonio police working with three pieces of evidence in a couple of armed robberies. They say a gun, a backpack, and the suspect's confessions tie him to both cases. Investigators say this guy, 29 year old Nathan Flores, stole a white Chevy at gunpoint this afternoon. That vehicle soon found on the near west side near Rivas and San Gabriel. Police also found Flores and say he confessed to this robbery as well as to one at a convenience store on South Sarsomora yesterday. Investigators say witnesses also told police about the same distinct backpack and gun in both of those cases. And cases of monkeypox continue to rise here in San Antonio Metro Health confirmed 20 cases. That's three more than Friday. We have a limited amount of vaccine, but a new technique could stretch that out. Right now, there are three priority groups. They consist of those who were exposed, those who had close contact with someone who had monkeypox, and those living with HIV or people taking the HIV prevention drug prep. And that's a look at your night beat news flash. Coming up, it was caught on camera. One man says his training kicked right in as several people came together to help the victim of that rollover. If you see something like this, help, you know, uh, because you know what? You could be put in the same situation maybe one day. How that military veteran, a group of strangers worked together. That story coming up. And remember this video? It was back in late June. Now new numbers are showing a change at the border. Those new developments and more come your way next, right here on the Night Beat. And new tonight, police are investigating reports of rigged explosives at a home in Round Rock. Authorities called to the scene of a person who possibly barricaded themselves inside the house. Neighbors evacuated as a precaution surrounding roadways are temporarily closed. Austin's police department's bomb squad are also on the scene. We continue to monitor this situation. Of course, we'll update you if anything new develops. Fewer people may be attempting to illegally cross the border. Migrant encounters are actually down along the southwest border for a second straight month. U.S. Customs and Border Protection is running a digital campaign to discourage people from making that potentially deadly journey. But that's not stopped people from trying. Our cameras were right there as migrants attempted to cross the Rio Grande back in late June. It's unclear if the summer heat is actually a reason for this recent drop that we're seeing. Now, in the meanwhile, Governor Abbott says that state troopers have returned more than 3,900 migrants to the border. The governor directed troopers to transport migrants in early July. A new video tonight, several witnesses responding to a rollover crash near 410 and Morrison Boulevard over on the city's south side. John David Escobedo took this video as a group flipped over that car. The military veteran says he was one of the first people on the scene, but he couldn't do much because he had a broken hand. So as people started arriving, he began delegating tasks. As I assessed the situation, um, the car did uh, was steaming from the radiator, so I knew that it wasn't on fire. Um, so that's what kind of pu pushed me to say, hey, let's get this car flipped over. Yeah, Escobedo says he has training as an incident commander. That training kicked in as he saw everyone helping. He pulled out his own camera. San Antonio police and other first responders arrived within minutes. But what an effort by complete strangers. We left him in the vehicle. He was conscious uh, at the time, but he was uh, he was badly injured. Uh, he said his ribs hurt. Uh, he had you know blood on his face. The man taken to the hospital. Escobedo says he's encouraged by capturing the kindness of strangers on camera and hopes to reconnect with the victim. All right, now we want to take a live look outside. 81 degrees right now, and if you could see the lens right there, I don't know if those are some drops right there, it's just some Ready? moisture, or it's just the humidity. Those are dried raindrops, so wow. it rained enough on that camera for there to be a little bit of dirt that collected on the Got camera it. there. Got it. Like some, our cars. <laughs> some areas of our viewing, some of our parts of our viewing area got a lot of rain. They did. They did, Steve. And we're going to talk about how those who got a lot of rain, how that's going to benefit them when it comes to the drought conditions. And even around San Antonio, hey, we got about a quarter to half an inch of rain in many places. We will take the rain in this drought. Take a look at the radar right now. I want to go ahead and give you a look at what's happening outside. All the rain has moved west to San Antonio. 
Antonio, uh, west of San Antonio, and that is where it is going to stay. But let's go ahead and zoom in to Maverick County right now. We've got some light rain on going around Maverick County, and in Laredo, there's actually a flash flood warning for the next 30 minutes or so. Now you can see that the heaviest of the rains has finally started to move out of Laredo. But there were several water rescues reported there because they've seen three to five inches of rain. Let's talk about the rainfall so far. Here's a look at the observed rainfall over the last 48 hours. Catula, more than four inches of rainfall, more than an inch increase of springs, three inches in Pearsall, Del Rio, Eagle Pass, one to two inches of rain. Again, you can see that area south and west of San Antonio really got the heavy rainfall, which was helpful when you consider the fact that there are areas of exceptional and extreme extreme drought. Very good for our local farmers and ranchers and for our economy too. That is good news there. Now again, unfortunately, only about about quarter to half an inch of rain in neighborhoods around San Antonio, but up to an inch in Castroville, more than an inch in Uvalde and an inch and a half in Divine. And if you missed out on the rain, Today and yesterday, there's some chances in our near future, but tomorrow will remain dry for the most part. It's going to be cloudy in the morning, 76 degrees. Your KSAT 12 hour forecast shows a warm up into the upper 80s by noon. You know, we were only at 88 degrees today for the high temperature. We're going to already be there around lunch tomorrow. And then as for the high temperature tomorrow, 96 with a 10% chance for a coastal shower. So again, tomorrow is going to mainly be dry. That 96 though is going to feel a lot hotter because of high humidity. Take a look at neighborhood highs 95 in Hondo, 94 Uvalde, 94 Creese Springs, 97 in Canyon Lake, hotter off to the east. And again, it's going to stay fairly humid, very humid in the morning with dew points in the 60s in the afternoon. So that means a heat in index anywhere from 100 to 102. So please make sure to stay hydrated. Again, if you missed out on the rain, we've got some other chances Thursday and Friday, especially 30% chance for some showers and some storms. We may even be able to bump up those numbers as forecasting details come into more of a 2020 vision. I also want to bring the tropics to your attention. There's an area near Panama that is disturbed and has about a 20% chance of development in the Bay of Campeche in the next five days. So we'll continue to keep you updated with that. It's a low chance for development, but oftentimes the rains we get this time of year are from the tropics. So we'll keep you updated. Thank you, Sarah. Let's get to some breaking news. This is in the far eastern part of the city on FM 1346 and Loop 1604. Law enforcement working a crash in that area. And to give you a better idea of what we're talking about, this is west of St. Hedwig, not quite all the way to I-10. But again, this is on 1604 near FM 1346. Yeah, you know, whenever something happens on the outer loop, we've got to tell you about it because it could affect traffic. As we see right there, it looks like there's only, there are two vehicles yep. that were involved in that crash, but that's only because our Sky 12 camera zoomed in right there. So that's all we can see. You could even see some scar parts. Cattered, uh, scattered right there on the road. But of course, we're going to continue to follow up with this and we'll let you know if it affects traffic in the next few hours or even tomorrow morning. All right, let's switch over to yeah. sports right now and talk about a man who, if anybody deserves just to get into the hall for his heart, it's oh, Manu Ginobili. Clearly the most popular spur uh, because of his passion, the yes. way he played the game. But now it's kind of neat to see that Tim and Manu are teaming again this time in the Hall of Fame. And I hope Tony's going to go too. That would be awesome. When we come back, Tim Duggan, a big announcement today by the Hall of Fame, something we had already been kind of indicated before today. And the Aggies ranked in the top ten to start the college football season coming up. We knew that Manu Ginobili was heading into Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame, but now we know who's presenting him officially, Tim Duncan. Hall of Fame announced today that Duncan would introduce his teammate as a retirement ceremony in September, even though Manu indicated that back in April. Ginobili will be the fourth Spur to get the call to the Hall. He is the second member of the Spurs Big Three, following Duncan, who was a member of the class of 2020 and enshrined in May of 2021. Alongside Tony Parker, the two won four NBA championships together in 2003, 05, 07, and 14. Ginobili is also the winningest player in NBA history, winning 72.1% of his games he played. Number two on that list is Duncan at 71.9%. Former Spurs player George Carl is also going in as a coach. The enshrinement ceremony will be held at Symphony Hall in Springfield, Massachusetts on September the 10th.
Camping with KSAT, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Houston Texans start their rebuild season with a 17-13 victory over the New Orleans Saints on NRG Stadium on Saturday night. The young man who stole the show was running back Damian Pierce, who the Texans drafted in the fourth round out of Florida. And he got his pro career off to a great start on just his first carry that went for 20 yards. Texans have not had a solid run game since 2019. Now Pierce gives fans and teammates hope. He ran the ball extremely, extremely well tonight. I think what his average was over nine yards or something per carry. Um, if he can keep doing stuff like that, it's going to open up our offense in a big way. Um, I think the whole running back room is really talented. And, I mean, Damian showed kind of what they've, the work they've put in um, through the off season and throughout camp. Um, and he played well tonight. And next up for the Texans, they travel to Los Angeles to take on the defending Super Bowl champion Rams Friday night, 9 p.m. at SoFi Stadium. The Fighting Texas Aggies are ranked sixth in the nation to open the 2022 college football season. That's according to the Associated Press preseason poll released today. The number six ranking matches the highest for the Aggies since earning the number three overall spot headed into the 1995 season, the 16th time the Aggies have earned a top 10 ranking in the first AP poll of the season. Even more to look forward to this season after senior defensive back Damani Richardson was asked if this is the deepest team he's ever been involved in in College Station. Yes, for sure. D-line wise, even though some of them are young, they're all are very talented um, linebackers. Um, the kid from Houston or Louisiana, Martre Martrell, he's good. Um, but I feel like like all around, we've been um, we're like very rounded. We have a lot of depth, tight end, quarterback, um, receivers. I just feel like we're real rounded, and we have like a lot of depth everywhere. All right, let's check out that top 10. Of course, Alabama is number one, 54 overall first place votes, followed by Ohio State with six, Georgia with three. Then you followed up with Clemson and Notre Dame at number five. Second half of the top 10, of course, starts off with Texas A&M at number six, followed by Utah, Michigan, Oklahoma, Baylor at number 10, and at number 24, Houston. The countdown to kickoff for two different seasons. <laughs> Next. The UTSA Roadrunners did not make the AP Top 25 in the preseason poll, even though they finished 12 and 2 in Conference USA champions. But they will host the number 24 team, Houston, in their season opener September the 3rd. That is just 20 days away. The Roadrunners continue with their fall camp today. Head coach Jeff Trailer gets ready for his third season as a head coach coming off a of school best season. Now it's about improving from what he has been able to build. Safety Rashad Wisdom decided not to turn pro, return for his senior season. That's after he was named the Conference USA first team for the second season in a row after leading UTSA in tackles with 88, but prepare for a little different look on defense. We got a lot of playmakers in that in that back end now, so uh, there are going to be a lot of different things, a lot of different people on the field at, at different times, and um, a lot of people moving around, and, you know, that's just to give everyone an opportunity to go make a play and, uh, you know, just go have fun. Kickoff September the 3rd in the Alamo Dome is set for 2.30 p.m., and they're hoping for over 40,000 fans to pack the dome. One of the teams participating in the KSAP Pigskin Classic 2022 presented by your San Antonio area Chevy dealers are the Judson Rockets. They will challenge the Johnson Jaguars in their season opener, the middle game of our triple header on August the 27th in the Alamo Dome. Mark Soto returns to Converse where he played in coach for Judson. And now his job is to right the Rockets ship after a rare playoff miss last year with a four and six finish. He will have 14 starters back, seven on offense, seven on defense, including big defensive lineman Johnny Bowens at six foot four, 200. 60 pounds. We're like a brotherhood over here. Um, that's what Coach Soto's really stressing. Um, I'm glad he's really pushing that on us. So, you know, that's really brought us all together. It's a mentality of uh, being able to ride for the brand and being able to, everyone playing for each other, playing for the people that have been here before, people that are going to be here in the future. What we've learned is if, if you keep your standards high, kids will raise to that standard and the expectation high. And I, I think our kids understand that. I think our community understands that. And thanks to the Judson School District and in particular Judson High School for inviting me out tonight for Meet the Rockets Night. And great to see the parents out because they are crucial in the support no matter what school you go to. Yeah, yeah. and I'm glad it didn't get rained out. And it did not get rained out again. Yes. Again. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Greg. Sure. We're back in two minutes. It's been a pleasure having you with us tonight. Absolutely. GMSA comes your way at 430 in the morning. Have a wonderful night and stay cool.